It is time now to give Connecticut's health care system a checkup of sorts. We're going to take a look at ways experts are working to make improvements uh, to the system for our citizens, for all of our citizens. And we're going to start with an issue that came up several times in the recent governor's race and certainly was a major part of the debate over health care reform, and that is how to fix, how to eliminate the racial disparities that exist in health care. Now here for a closer look at that issue are Natalie Holder-Winfield. She is an attorney and the president of Compliance and Talent Management Training for Quest Diversity Initiatives, and also Dr. Bruce Gould, who is the who is affiliated with the Connecticut Multicultural Health Partnership. He is also a professor at the UConn School of Medicine. He's associate dean for primary care at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine, the medical director of the Bergdorf Health Center, and he's also the medical director for the city of Hartford's health department. That's a lot to, to say. Very accomplished, doctor. <laughs> Thank you both for being here. And if we could start off talking about what are the racial disparities that exist. I think people uh, might have a question about that. Can you give, me, give us some ideas? December is AIDS Awareness Month. Uh -huh. Recently we you know, celebrated World AIDS Awareness Day because once again there is an issue or there is an interest in focusing on AIDS, making sure that it's not an issue that you know, just disappears. Even though we have seen increased outcomes, we've seen better outcomes. However, there are certain populations that are still heavily impacted. Even though African Americans only make up 13% of the nation's population, we presented 49 cases or 49 percentage of the 49 percent of the AIDS cases in this country. Hispanics, we or Hispanics, we represent three to five times more percent of the you know AIDS cases in this country. African American women, 22 percent more times of the AIDS cases in this country. So there are some stark and very distinct AIDS, you know uh, healthcare disparities in this country when you look at you know color, ethnicity, and culture. And and we were talking before the show that um, the easy answer to that, or the easy, I think, explanation that people might grapple towards is that um, it's a matter of economics. And that's not always the case, right? Not necessarily. Last month, we hosted, my, you know, my firm, Quest Diversity Initiatives, we hosted a conference at the Yale Smilo Cancer Center, which was an effort to increase the number of resources that were available to health care providers who were interested in learning more about cultural competency within health care. And we had Dr. Wayne Rawlings from Aetna, who studies health care disparities. And he noted that even within the insured population, there are still stark health care disparities that run along racial lines. Right, even within the insured population. And I have heard people say that the missing link in health care reform, as much as they support it, is that it does not, um, that access is not quite enough to address racial disparities because there's lots of reasons um, that people don't access health care, which go beyond uh, whether or not they have the money to. Dr. Gould, if you could talk to us about, um, in your, I don't know, just some practical examples of, of, of you seeing um, with patients that you have and, and their reluctance or perhaps uh, hesitancy to access health care? Taking care of patients is uh, part science and part art and I think part of the art is, is trying to um, build a bridge between the provider and the patient so that you can actually share both who you are and who the patient is. I think that trying to rely solely on what we learn in textbooks really doesn't work. Um, you know, I often say to my students that when all else fails, ask the patient. And I think when we talk about health disparities and we talk about cultural competence, cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, in fact, asking the patient about their background, about their culture, about uh, their health belief system often helps us take what we learn about general populations and apply it specifically to an individual person sitting in front of us and their really very specific needs and um, community from which they come because otherwise you're just not successful. I think um, what Natalie was saying about health disparities is, is absolutely true. That all other things being equal, as we look across different ethnic cultural groups, we find that some groups do worse with cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, etc. And you have to say, well, what is it? If you look just at socioeconomics, that does explain a part of it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't explain all of it. And so a lot of it has to do with how we provide that health care, both cultural and linguistic uh, competency, so that when a patient comes into that environment, they feel um, welcoming and that also the health care providers understand what they're bringing to the table. Right. And I, I thought it was interesting we 
were speaking earlier that um, sometimes the things that you need to be sensitive to are, are quite subtle. Uh, you mentioned um, there might be uh, culturally they don't want to be looked at in the eye or they don't want to be touched. So that would be an instance where, um, you know, Natalie, you can chime in on this too. I mean, is that something that you... You know, because you can't have a doctor know everything about every culture. Um, you know, they're not like right. a cultural anthropologist. But um, and that would be impossible. Right, right. It's like me saying that I'm going to teach you how to bake every cake in the world. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Even though I can show you how to bake some cakes, I'm not going to be able to teach you everything about baking every cake. But I can teach you processes. I can teach you about mixing. I can teach you about the process of how do you go about baking a cake. So similarly within healthcare, even though you're not going to be able to learn everything about every culture. You can, as you know, Dr. Gould mentioned, start asking questions right. so that you can learn more about each culture that you're encountering. The last thing that you want to do is stereotype anyone. Uh -huh. For instance, I'm, I would self-identify as African American. Uh -huh. However, there are people who look like me who self-identify as being Latino. Uh -huh. There are people who look like me who self-identify as being West Indian American uh -huh. or just West Indian. So you never want to make those assumptions or even you know, go a step further and think, oh, I can learn everything about all these different populations through a cultural competency training course. So what sorts of things, Dr. Gould, um, have you done in your in your clinics or with uh, with your students to help them to become more aware of, of these sensitivities and subtleties? At UConn, um, in the undergraduate medical education curriculum, there is a whole section on cultural competence, not only ethnic, cultural, it's also about transsexual, um, yeah. sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's video taping, there are actually um, standardized patients, so actors that uh, come in and take on the persona and symptoms of a certain disease mm -hmm. as well as cultural issues. And the students actually are run through uh, these standardized patients both in order to learn more but also this is used as a test so that as we promote students from one year to the next year or from one level of training to the next level of training, they have to pass certain tests in actually interacting with a patient. Now granted, these are standardized patients, they're not real patients, but one would hope that if they are able to interact in a certain way with, with these patients that it would at least carry over to some degree to real patients. And just to bring it back, the reason that this is important is because if you aren't sensitive or you don't make the patient feel comfortable, then they won't come back and seek the care that they perhaps might need? And they... they... Patients are very good about sensing if you don't value who they are. Um, a large part, I think, of cultural uh, appropriateness, cultural sensitivity, is just valuing diversity. And patients will sense if you don't value uh, their culture and, and uh, their ethnic group, etc. And by doing that, things open up. But the other piece is that as you're trying to create a diagnostic plan and a therapeutic plan for a patient, to actually get them to do certain things, to take pills, etc., unless there is that trust and that shared value of each other, they really don't move forward with it, and so you don't get as good outcomes as you might otherwise get. Right, and you had mentioned uh, to Natalie also that um, it has to do with even how doctors and nurses and the staff interact with each other. So often we forget that our healthcare facilities are workplaces, and the last thing that we want are workplaces in where people don't get along with each other. All of us have the experience, or know of someone who has the experience, of working in an environment in where there's a lot of dysfunction, and where there's a lot of discord. When people don't get along, their teams are not working cohesively, mm -hmm. and that often leads to poor outcomes. So in healthcare, one of the most important professions you can think of, you want to make sure that people are working cohesively and that people are working as a team to ensure that there are better patient outcomes. Good example, the U.S. Veterans Administration. Uh -huh. When they did research earlier um, in the year 2000, I want to say two, they found that they had higher incidences of violence than even the U.S. Postal Service. Wow. And so they did an incredible amount of work to ensure that they were reducing violence and increasing civility and also increasing diversity and understanding amongst their, um, their staff members. Interesting.
there. And they found that as a result, that if they were able to increase the civility and make their employees more, you know, more team-like, if they were able to get them to work as a team, that that actually reduced the number of days that a patient would stay in the ICU. Wow, that's amazing. That's really amazing. We only have about 30 seconds left, but tell me about Faces of Disparity, because I know that that conference at the Yale Smilo Center was really a kickoff for that. So we were happy to have the Multicultural Health Partnership of Connecticut contribute their Faces to, or sorry, Faces of Disparities panels to our conference. They were displayed. That's an exhibit that can be hosted at every hospital in the state of Connecticut. And that's part of my goal as the communications chair of the partnership to ensure that every hospital has an opportunity to have that exhibit. Right. Excellent. Thank you so much for both coming here. It's a very interesting topic, and I appreciate your time. Thanks to Natalie Holzer-Winfield and to Dr. Bruce Gould for their visit today. Don't forget, if you missed something here on The Real Story, you can now watch it online by going to ctnow.com. You can also catch us on YouTube. Thanks for watching this week's edition of The Real Story. We'll see you here again next week.